Hi there and welcome to this week's edition of Ignite News. I'm Greg Rosser. And I'm Carlin Miguel. You know, Carlin, it is the best time ever to be a nerd right now. That's true. We actually had a couple of reporters head out to Hamilton Comic Con this past week. That's right. And I mean, the DC Comics, they just released their new movie lineup all the way into 2020, starting with Wonder Woman, then moving into Shazam. The Rock has been confirmed as playing Black Adam. Standalone Ben Affleck Batman movies, Another Man of Steel, Dawn of Justice 1 and 2. We're looking at League of Justice 1 and 2. You know, we're looking at the Marvel Universe with the new Avengers, another Avengers. Robert Downey Jr. just said he'd sign on for three more Iron Mans. Henry Pym's Ant-Man. I mean, Carlin? Carlin. Where'd, Carlin, where'd you go? Halloween came early at Comic-Con where cosplayers and fans came together for a full day of fantasy and treats. Stars hailing from such movies as Catwoman, The Hulk, and Austin Powers met hundreds of fans of the Hamilton Convention Center. One of the celebs in attendance, Garrett Wong from Star Trek Voyager, talks of his stint on the show and sums it up in one sentence. Harry, did the probe, did the probe go through? And I look, at the, I look at Captain Janeway and I say, and I say like a snake through a tube, Captain. So that would be my humorous answer. <laughs> like a snake through a cake, really. Uh, I mean, just because, just again, meeting everybody, it was a, to me, that was the funnest one to film. Yeah. If you're planning on dressing up for next year's cosplay competition, prep early, as judges Destiny Nicholson and Nicola Marie Jean are judging your costume by how unique you can make it. A lot of them are based on uh, craftsmanship, so people have to make about, I think it's about 70%. And some of them are performance based, so it depends on your stage presence, uh, if you do a skit, things like that, how in character you are. So it really just depends on the convention and what guidelines they give us to go by. And if you're interested in the endless merch and comics, one guy's handmade wands from the Harry Potter series drew a crowd. And I uh, use various woods and stones and amalgamate them all together to create something a little bit different for this kind of con. So. <laughs> Uh, actually the uh, staff of Odin so this is uh, it has um, um, elk antlers on the top and then I've carved Odin's face into it and there's actually garnets in the eyes so this is actually made out of curly willow wood and I've added a, a whole bunch of uh, Nordic runes so those are Nordic runes on there and then some Celtic runes on the back <laughs> Next year's show will be hard to talk with the star power and crowds of 2014's Hamilton Comic Con. For Ignite Entertainment, I'm Jennifer Taylor. We're here today at 101.5 The Hawk, Mohawk's own radio station. Mohawk is actually known for its radio broadcasting program. That's right, and they just launched a new program to give students a chance to listen to some new genres of music. Kareem Moza has a story. Jason Derulo with Trumpets here on Ignite Radio. I'm Martin Van Gogh. Mohawk College is home to two radio stations with student hosts. 101.5 The Hawk, which plays alternative rock, and the online station Ignite Radio, which plays the biggest hits. Ariana Grande, uh, Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake, and also Iggy Azalea. And uh, we always add a new music each week, uh, whatever that is charting on the top 100 billboard. And also we have some old school stuff from the 90s that we throw in sometimes, and, and just so it's a mix up of new stuff and old stuff. But Ignite Radio listeners are treated to more than just music. You can also hear announcers who are learning. Are there mistakes made? Sure, there are. But there's also some radio gold as well um, from, from these students who are um, really trying to showcase what they've got. So it's, it's pretty cool to, to listen and tune in and know that this announcer could be on a major radio station in the next year or two. It's, it's really cool. According to radio program coordinator Sam Cook, Ignite Radio has greatly benefited the radio students. I think the biggest thing they take away is confidence because they know that someone's listening so they put a bit more effort into doing their shows and at the end of the day they're more confident at the end of the day so they can leave this program saying okay I know everything I have to know let me go out there and get better now at a, a radio station where I'm getting paid. But radio students didn't always have this opportunity. But students were learning 
um, basically through a closed circuit station, which basically means they were talking through a microphone and it was just going out one speaker into the hallway. And that was wonderful at the time, but times have changed. So I felt um, by starting an internet radio station, it allowed these students to go on the air and know they're being heard, not just from a few passing people, but from hundreds, possibly thousands of people online. Coach says that the ability to host a show on an alternative rock station, as well as on a top 40 station, better prepare students to work in the radio industry. So it gives the students a chance to really learn from two different formats, because they are different when you're on the air. Um, and I think that that's important for students to know that, because when you leave school, you can't always go, you know, I'm going to get a job at 102.1 The Edge and start right there. Sometimes you have to go to a country station or a top 40 station. So putting them in different situations and different formats really helps hone their skills to become an overall well-rounded announcer or personality. Music programming assistant Mark Bradley explains the experience has taught him what it takes to manage a radio station. I'm learning to fully run a radio station to schedule the shows, uh, making sure we're hitting CanCon at 35%, and also um, producing splitters, liners, uh, images for the radio station, and uh, pretty much getting a uh, first step in the door of how to manage uh, a radio station. Listeners can stream Ignite Radio through igniteradio.ca. For Ignite News, I'm Kareem Mosna. You know, Carlin, students may not have a lot of time between classes and work and everyday life, but Mohawk did host a volunteer job fair. That's right. One of our reporters, Kyle Williamson, actually had a chance to check it out. Mohawk College hosted its fifth annual volunteer fair put on by Student Engagement. The fair gave students the opportunity to connect with different agencies, all of which are looking for student volunteers. One of these local services is the Children's International Learning Center. We're a hands-on museum. We provide programs for school groups after school, uh, Girl Guide Scouts, and we do a lot of interactive activities that are educational and teach them things. And the ways you can get involved are you can be a helper for programming for setup of displays, you can help facilitate, and you can be on our program um, fundraising team and PR. For animal lovers looking to volunteer, Animal Experience International may be of interest. So we are, we send people volunteering with animals around the world. We have 26 different programs in 13 different countries. And so what we do is we place students or people that are done with school, no matter what their experience or their education, we figure out where to send them with animals. So someone in veterinary sciences could work on a spay and neuter project in Nepal, or if they were just interested in dogs and it was someone doing social work, they could go to Nepal and work in Tibetan refugee camps and work with dogs there in a different way that's not medical. Uh, we do a lot of advocacy work, but most of it is international volunteering. So they look at where they can volunteer, what they want to do, look at the species or the country, and then, yeah, just go have an adventure with animals around the world. Students who miss the fair can visit Mohawk's Student Engagement webpage for a full list of volunteer opportunities. For Ignite News, I'm Kyle Williamson. I'm here in Iowing today where a lot of people on campus come to play games, video or otherwise. and. Movies have tried to make the transition into the genre of video games and usually with little success. Now, Alien Isolation is attempting to break that cycle. Ignite News reporter Steven Sobot has a story. This is Ripley, last survivor of the Nostromo, signing off. The Alien franchise is one of the most venerable and influential science fiction series in history. Countless sci-fi games and movies take inspiration from it. You can even argue Alien is more influential than Star Wars. Just look at Halo, gung-ho space marines facing a parasitic alien race that morphs its hosts into terrifying creatures. However, when people mention Alien, they're usually referring to the first two movies, Alien and Aliens. Why? Well, maybe because any Alien movie after the second was uninspired or not as fascinating may also be because almost every Alien game was just a standard first-person shooter with a tinge of horror tacked on. No Alien game really made you feel like you're actually trying to survive in a desolate space station. Until now. 
Alien Isolation is a survival horror game developed by the Creative Assembly and published by Sega. The game takes place 15 years after Alien, but 42 after Aliens. You play as Ellen Ripley's daughter, Amanda, who is looking for her missing mother. An official from the Weyland yutani Corporation tells her they have found the flight recorder of the spaceship Nostromo, the ship her mother was on during the events of Alien. You are sent to the Sevastopol space station only to be separated from your crew and left alone in the dark, dreary station. Samuels! Taylor! Respond! Anybody! If there's one word to describe alien isolation, it's foreboding. For the first hour in the station, you don't meet a single living being. You are left to your own imagination as to what happened. And then when you do meet someone, he's pointing a gun to your head. Axel and you, oh, uh, he's Axel, by the way, try to find a way off the station, but he gets killed by a xenomorph. However, as you progress through the game, you'll find the alien is sometimes the least of your worries. Weary human survivors shoot first and ask questions later, and the working Joe Android's creepy demeanor and blank slate faces hide a darkness that will be revealed later on. The game gets survival horror down perfectly, but sometimes too perfectly. Your health is relatively realistic, so you can only take one or two bullets before you die. Enemies are very unpredictable, which also means you're going to have to redo sections of the game over and over again. Combat is clunky, but it wouldn't make sense for an untrained mechanic to know how to kill someone else. The game really shines when you have to sneak around enemies. It gets very intense when the threat is within meters of your location, but then walks away because it couldn't find you. When you find the flight record of the Nostromo corrupted and damaged, you feel the same feeling of dread Ripley feels. It's very immersive. Overall, it's the closest thing we'll ever get to experience Alien, so give this game a go. Alien Isolation is available on Steam, Xbox 360 and Xbox One, and PlayStation 3 and PlayStation 4. Don't tell them anything. Look, I've got the elevator working. Jana, let's go, okay? I... I'm sorry. Good luck. So, Carlin, do you like jazz? Why? Well, the Steel City Jazz Festival is in town this week. That's right, Cream Mosna had a chance to sit down with the event coordinator and find out what went into planning this festival. If you want to keep your arm, you best move it. What time is it? It's time to go. Steel City Jazz Fest organizer Chris Ferguson says he was inspired by a trip to Detroit to help fill the jazz void in Hamilton. I got the first inspiration for the festival when I went to the Detroit Jazz Festival in 2012 and I went with my girlfriend Emily. And the Detroit Jazz Festival is this kind of amazing festival. It's all free, um, it's all outdoor. Uh, so you're right downtown Detroit and uh, they got stages set up and it's just really exciting, a fun time. You get to see a lot of big, huge names in jazz for free. Um, so I had a great time there and it kind of got me thinking, well, why isn't there a jazz festival in Hamilton? Because it seems like every other little town has a jazz festival. You know, I grew up in Oakville, there's an Oakville jazz festival. There's jazz festivals all over, but not in Hamilton. And so I kind of got to thinking, well, you know, maybe that's something that I could put together. The Steel City Jazz Fest offers more than just one style of jazz. Well, I don't know what other people think of when... I'm when they hear jazz, they might think of kind of straight ahead jazz, maybe with a singer, kind of cocktail music. But jazz covers like a million different, different styles. And uh, I don't pretend that we cover everything at the festival, but I think we cover a good number. So, I mean, we certainly have singers. We have the kind of straight ahead, uh, you know, quartet combo jazz. Uh, we also have big bands. Opening the festival is the Hamilton Dixieland All-Stars. It's kind of that old style New Orleans party band jazz. And um, I mean, on uh, Wednesday the 22nd, we have a show at Christchurch Cathedral, uh, which is featuring kind of like a free jazz duo of Mike Gennaro and Colin Fisher. So it's drums and saxophone. And I mean, that sounds totally different than the Dixieland All-Stars. And they're from like vastly different eras of jazz but uh, they all get kind of lumped under this, you know, very broad heading jazz. We've got uh, um, a fantastic drummer named Carlos Rodriguez, who's playing a show with, uh, it's a quintet, 
and he plays kind of Latin jazz and he's really knowledgeable about Latin American music and kind of its fusion with jazz. So yeah, we're all over the place and uh, hopefully there's something there for everyone. Ferguson said he paid particular attention to the Hamilton music community when arranging the festival's lineup. All the artists have some connection to Hamilton, so a lot of them live and work in Hamilton. Um, but some of them, you know, maybe now live in Toronto, but either went to school in Hamilton or grew up in Hamilton. So one of the first things I look for is that connection because I really want the Steel City Jazz Festival to uh, promote the Hamilton jazz community and to introduce people to that community. The second annual Steel City Jazz Fest kicks off on October 15th at Artward Art Bar. There will be tickets available at the door for all of the shows. Um, if you want to reserve tickets in advance, you can email uh, the venues or you can email me at steelcityjazzfestival at gmail.com and just say, you know, how many tickets you'd like to reserve and for what night and uh, we'll make sure that you're on kind of the reservation list. According to Ferguson, a jazz concert stands out because of the improvisation and communication between the musicians. Maybe more so than other types of music, jazz is something that uh, is really best appreciated live. So you, you know, you might go see a rock band and they'll play their songs and maybe they change the arrangement a little bit to like make it a bit more exciting live. But it's, you know, a lot of the time more or less it's the same structure of the song that you hear on the record. Whereas jazz, I mean, it might be the same structure, but the whole idea is that it's improvised, right? And so it's going to be different every single time that it's played. As an audience member, I, don't, I feel very involved in the performance. You're listening to what each you know, player is doing and how they're communicating together. And uh, it's something that I find really engaging and I hope other people do too. For Ignite News, I'm Kareem Mosna. Now October is definitely prime time for primetime TV. Thursday nights are seeming to be the hottest nights if you want to sit down and watch something other than football. Our TV reviewer Kyle Williamson has the latest. Thursday Night TV is full of drama this fall, with so many shows to pick from. I am here to tell you which shows you'll want to catch, and which ones you can do without. You should really pay attention. You might learn something. You might as well rename Thursday Shonda Rhimes Night. Grey's Anatomy is back for its 11th season, and Scandal for its 4th. Now Rhimes has managed to fit in another Thursday Night drama you will want to miss. How to Get Away with Murder is the new buzz show of the season. The show is about four bright law students who for unknown reasons kill someone. It was once said that you aren't guilty unless you're caught. In How to Get Away with Murder, you aren't guilty until you're convicted. Will these four get away with this brutal crime, or will they pay for what they did? Tune in at 10 on CTV to find out. Everything after this moment will not only determine your career, but life. You can spend it in a corporate office drafting contracts and hitting on chubby paralegals before finally putting a gun in your mouth. Or you can join my firm and become someone you actually like. I want to be her. Another new show you need to catch this fall is Grace Point. This 10 episode drama tells the story of two detectives trying to find the murderer of a young boy in a small town. Grace Point stars Breaking Bad's Anna Gunn and Doctor Who star David Tennant. The show is a remake of the British drama Broadchurch but promises a new and exciting divergence from the original. I am relying on you to catch them. Thursdays are also the night for returning dramas like The Vampire Diaries, Rain, and Bones, and you won't want to miss the final season of Parenthood on NBC. New comedies are a little weak this year. A to Z is a new rom-com that has some promise. This is the love story of Andrew and Zelda from its beginning to its end. Andrew is a hopeless romantic and Zelda is skeptical when it comes to love. They will date for eight months, three weeks, five days and one hour. But then what? Tune into NBC at 9.30 to find out. This television program is the comprehensive account of their relationship from A to Z. Bad Judge is just bad. This new comedy is one to skip. Kate Walsh may be a brilliant actress, but this leading lady sure isn't funny. The show is about a trashy, sex and booze addict who happens to be a judge. 
She also takes responsibility for a boy who was put into a group home after she threw his parents into jail. Bad Judge is sure to be an early cancellation this fall, so don't bother starting this series. When this kid, Alfonso, comes at you, you hold up your hands like you're afraid to fight like that, right? And then BOOM! Nothing scares a bully like seeing his own blood. That's the best advice a grown-up's given me in a long time. And now you know what to watch and what to skip Thursdays this fall. For Ignite Entertainment, I'm Kyle Williamson. We're here today in the outdoor portion of the David Braley Athletic and Recreation Center on campus at Mohawk College. And you know, Carlin, last season I had the pleasure of broadcasting for the men's and women's varsity basketball teams. You must have seen some absolutely great games, and we're hoping for some more great games now that the preseason is finally over. The women's volleyball team hit the court to host their second preseason game against George Brown. The Mountaineers got off to an early lead in the first set. Mohawk's powerful strikes and solid serving led them to a 25-10 win. The second match was a tough battle for the women as the Huskies forced Mohawk to play a more defensive set. The women continued to push, dominating George Brown with their strong serves, leading them to a 25-14 victory. The Mountaineers were able to maintain their tough play in the third match, but the Huskies were not ready to give up yet and kept Mohawk to a short lead. In the end, Mohawk ran away with a 25-20 victory. Head coach Andy Nicholson says his team was finally able to play a more consistent game. Yeah, we were, uh, we were consistent tonight. We were working on some new defense, and that uh, by the second set was quite good. I thought our serving was quite strong, and our passing was better than the last match. So we, we achieved some things. We still can be much, much better. Um, we've been up and down. We haven't been consistent. Uh, we have a season coming up in less than a week, and we're not quite where we need to be. Takes time. Right side, Alexandria Pullum, says she personally needs to play a more aggressive game. Um, I think I played a little bit timid tonight, so I think I just need to be aggressive, and I need to demand the ball more and just hit the floor for every point. I think that everyone is really consistent, which helped us pull off the win. People were demanding the ball. We are trying out a new defense, and I think we're finally getting the hang of that now. The women will travel to St. Clair on Friday, October 24th for their first regular season game. For Ignite Sports, I'm Carlin McGill. Offense was the name of the game for the Mountaineers as they played the visiting George Brown Huskies. Despite a solid defensive effort on behalf of the Huskies, they were unable to overcome the Mountaineers' unrelenting attack, falling to the home team in three straight sets at the d -Burk. We're getting uh, better at the areas we were struggling out, mainly the blocking. We did a good job tonight. Um, and uh, if we can take care of some of our weaknesses and continue to get better, we're going to be uh, in a good spot. So I was pleased with their execution. Um, we were very controlled all night, uh, emotionally and tactically. So, uh, you know, I like where we were. But what was his team's best aspect? Yeah, I think the attacking side of the ball was fairly impressive. I think it, it was our, our, to be honest, you know, our setter is like a quarterback in football, and our setter did a really, really good job tonight um, finding the mismatches and, and, and attacking those mismatches, and uh, that allowed us to be very successful. Um, I thought he did a good job on the offensive side of the ball, and uh, it obviously showed. Um, we put a little bit of service pressure under them on them too, and so that allowed us to uh, um, execute defensively. So as, as we continue to work on our defensive side, and our side out is good, uh, we're going to be really tough to beat. Schnarr says the game helped teach him a few things about his team. Uh, I learned that we we're progressing. Uh, we've been tinkering with our lineup. I like the lineup we're currently using a lot, uh, but we are progressing, and that's what I saw tonight. We still have some little things to continue to clean up, and as, if we can clean those up, um, it'll be a tough out every night, and uh, you know we'll continue to work that way, and uh, you know we'll just give our best every night and uh, let the result take care of itself. Reporting for Ignite Sports, I'm Joshua Cooper. The Mohawk men's basketball squad stampeded over the Centennial Colts this past Tuesday, winning 100-73 in exhibition play. The Mountaineers were dominant in the paint, owning the boards and controlling the tempo of the game to improve their preseason record to 4-2. Matt Fennell obliterated his matchups, attacking the Colts relentlessly for 31 points, which included some particularly nasty dunks in the second half. Fennell used his size to attack the interior with ease, but also added two three-pointers from distance to keep his opponents guessing. 
the CCAA All-Canadian knows that the constant offensive aggression will be what opens up scoring opportunities for the whole team. I mean, practice we do all the time. I mean, coach just tells us to uh, keep attacking and then get guys open. I mean, I mean, the more we attack, the more we get our big guys looks and they give us looks. So, you know, it works out Andrew Sicatini was especially productive in the paint, adding 14 points and 19 rebounds of his own. Coach Brian Yonker knows that this is the level Fennel and Sicatini can play at consistently and expects solid performances from them throughout the season. For my money, I think they're the two best players in the country, so obviously they need to be involved every night, and um, on the offensive end in particular. And tonight both of them were involved, and, and that's usually good news for us. Centennial was particularly aggressive on defense, totaling 35 personal fouls, which kept Mohawk shooting free throws for most of the game. Mohawk made sure to take advantage of the charity stripe, with Sicatini going 10 for 15 from the line and Fennel going a perfect 7 for 7. The Mountaineers look to carry this momentum through the rest of the preseason and start the regular season off with some intensity. They take on Humber on October 23rd in their season opener. The Lady Mountaineers also pulled out a W against Centennial, 72 to 46. Mohawk proved themselves to be worthy competitors, earning themselves 29 points in the first half and then more than doubling that in the second. Mountaineers forward Portia Hewitt showed the team how much of an asset she truly is. Hewitt racked up a total of 17 points and 7 rebounds. Mohawk dominated Centennial in second chance points, 31 to 7. With 17 turnovers at halftime, it's no wonder Hewitt says the pressure defense in the second quarter is what really led the team to victory. Hewitt believes that this type of play is exactly what the Mountaineers need to keep winning. We focused on it a lot last year too, that's a big part of how Duffy coaches. And hopefully we're just going to cause a lot of turnovers and pressure teams and make them sweat a little bit. We need to come out how we came out in the second quarter and the first and if we do that we'll be fine. Head coach Kevin Duffy says that Hewitt's speed is a perfect example of how she contributes to the team. Portia is a really tough matchup at the post spot because she is very fast and, and she has a great endurance and she can run up and down the court. So her advantage is once we get a defensive rebound or even after the uh, opposing team scores a basket, she gets down the ball real quick and we have the type of guards that will headman the ball to her and get it to her in the right spot where she can just finish. So uh, that's, that's Porsche's kind of MO. She's also a great shooter, a catch and shoot type of player in open space. And that's something she needs to continue doing for, uh, to make those type of contributions for us this year. Guard Steph Rymack added 14 points and two steals, while guard Jen Genabella brought in 10 points overall and a whopping six steals. Duffy is positive and looking forward to what the rest of the season has to offer. As, as I tell the girls, you know, they don't hand out the championship in uh, October, November. It's handed out in February. So we're just looking forward to peaking at the right time and playing our best basketball when it counts. The Lady Mountaineers begin their regular season ascent October 23rd when they head to Toronto to take on Humber. Reporting for Ignite News, I'm Sean Maranka. Thank you for watching this week's edition of Ignite News. I'm Gregory Rosser. And I'm Carla McGill. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's not right. That's not you. I'm that's Carla McGill. Me. I'm Greg Rosser. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs>